So, Caleb, I've been seeing all these headlines all over the Internet, all over the newspapers saying, turn off your lights to help migrating birds. And I want to ask you, how could that possibly help birds turning off all your lights at night? Ah, I've been seeing these headlines as well. Very confusing topic, but we're going to get all the answers after the intro. This is a very weird topic to think about because what could turning off lights have to do with birds? Well, there's a few things at play that unless you dig beneath the surface, you're not going to know about why this is an impact. So let's get into it. The first thing that folks need to know is that the kind of birds we were talking about migrate exclusively at night. They're not migrating. What kind of birds? So what kind of birds are those? This is birds that are migrating um, to Central and South America for the winter. So it's, it's a lot of songbirds, things like warblers and tanagers and vireos and thrushes and grosbeaks. And then there's some larger birds uh, as well, some water birds and uh, rails and shorebirds. There's a, there's a number of other things that go at night. But the bulk of them that are the main issue are these songbirds that are doing this. So I want to show you a really interesting thing here from... Uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So this is a, an interesting migration tool called BirdCast from Cornell. And they actually take the Nexrad radar images from across the country, real time, and they put the data together to show you exactly where birds are migrating at any given time. And they produce so these live bird migration maps. I wanna show you one of these and we're going to do it from September 13th, which is just two days ago from when we're filming here. Sure. So I'm going to hit play and note that this is the 730 at night. That red line shows you where the sunset is occurring. So now it's dark out. This is 11 p.m., midnight, 1, 1 a.m., and so on. And what you notice is there's a lot of bright yellow areas. Well, that's where the radar is picking up huge densities of birds. There's the yellow line indicating uh, that the sun's coming back up. OK, and then all the, then the reflectivity quickly goes down to nothing. So what's going on here is the birds are picking up as soon as the sun goes down. And because they're made of water and radars pick up water, the radar will actually pick them up. And people say, well, that, that's got to be weather or something. Well, you go outside and look when the, the map is bright yellow. You look up in the sky and all you see is stars. You know it's not precipitation. Um, and we also know that it's birds because the radar will tell you the direction it's flying. And when, when it's flying against the wind, it's birds. There's nothing else that does that. No insects fly against the wind. So this we've known this for years. So the important thing is that when these birds are migrating, they are utilizing three mechanisms to orient themselves in the proper direction. Okay. They have a magnetic compass, which is still not even fully understood. Um, and they have a celestial orientation that they can do by looking at the location of the moon and the stars in the night sky. They literally know where the North Star is. This has been proven in experimentation. Wow. Um, and based on the time of the night that it is, they, they know uh, how to orient either north or south based on that. And so here's the key element of this for millennia. Thousands and thousands of years, these birds have been doing this at night. And only in the sky, uh, lights in the night sky are stars and the moon. Right. And nowadays, we've put up all these really tall communications towers. We've put up skyscrapers. And then we put on lights in those things. And birds are basically glorified reptiles, right? They're direct descendants of the dinosaurs. They don't have advanced mammalian-type brains like us. So these thinking processes just don't work for them. So what happens is... When they see these bright, bright lights that are unfamiliar in the night sky, they end up flying right toward the light itself, and in many cases, fly right into the light. And so if it's a light behind a skyscraper window, they fly right into the glass of the skyscraper and break their neck, and they're either badly injured and fall all the way down, or they're dead. So you'll mm -hmm. stand, you know, then the following morning, you stand at the base of the skyscraper, and there's literally hundreds and hundreds of dead birds littered all around the base of the skyscraper. It's, it's the same thing with communications towers, which can be as high as 2,000 feet out in North Dakota. And yeah. uh, those birds will come in and fly into the, to the tower itself, and they'll fly into those guy wires that you know, support the tower as they're circling the light. 
Yeah. So that's the mechanism that why this is a problem. It's so heartbreaking. You see these pictures from New York City. Uh, I think the Cornell Lab of Ornithology posted an article about it, um, or you know, was involved in an article about it a few years ago. Um, but they somebody went around and just collected all the samples from one night's worth of migration underneath some skyscraper in New York City. And it was like 350 birds. And it's exactly the birds that we see in our backyards. You know what I mean? It's, yes. it's the things that we cherish when they come around. It's Canada warblers. It's black pole warblers. Uh, I've seen yellow-billed cuckoos and hermit thrushes and Swainson's thrushes. All these things that we just love seeing in our backyards every single year. And we depend on them. And we, uh, we use them as a source of joy when we see them. They're being killed by the hunt by the thousand uh, every night. Because... When you were showing that uh, that migration um, radar from BirdCast, we're not talking thousands of birds or hundreds of birds. We're talking millions of birds. There are nights where over 100 million birds pass through our cities, uh, you know, throughout the U.S. and throughout the eastern seaboard. Yeah, exactly that right there. That's from I think that's from one night of migration hitting one skyscraper. This is it this is, is absolutely heartbreaking and it, it, it honestly makes me kind of gasp with a little bit of sadness at, at the, the magnitude of this. But there's an individual American woodcock. Here's another one. So there's about 30 woodcocks in there. These are getting into thrushes and warblers. And this, you know, it used to be in the 1980s and 70s and 60s, especially as for you get further back you get, they were not finding hundreds of things dead at a tower or at a skyscraper in one morning. They they were finding thousands, sometimes tens of thousands at a single tower or a single building. So this is not some like, you know, uh, tiny little problem. This is this is something that's actually affecting uh, a large percentage of, of these bird populations. So it actually is really important. And it's a really great contribution when the owners of these towers and buildings cooperate like this. So I really applaud, you know, Austin and these various towns that have done this. It just takes a long time to raise the consciousness about this. Um, you know, another issue is like, is this actually causing extinction in some of these species? Well, the truth is, it probably isn't doing that. But, you know, we've already lost 3 billion birds uh, in a period of decades. Um, the bird populations of, of many of these species, it's kind of death by a thousand paper cuts. You know, they're being, yeah. they're being hit by uh, feral cats. They're being hit by glass, including in the daytime. They're being hit by nights in the light sky. Habitat being, loss. Habitat <laughs> loss. Uh, pesticides in the tropics, especially. Um, on and on and on. And it's in that, that death by a thousand paper cuts gets them. And it, every stressor you add like this brings the population trajectories down and down. And, and, uh, and then, you know, you start wondering 50 years from now, 100 years from now, are these species going to be okay? If I can, if I can add one more thing, the challenge of migration that these birds, these long distance migrants are taking on is almost like, in, like in, an impossible task. I mean, they're flying from sometimes literally the Arctic Circle to literally like the southern parts of Brazil and Argentina. They are flying tens of thousands of miles every year. And you know, like you said, death by a thousand paper cuts. Listen, when you're flying, when you're making a 6,000 mile flight and you have to do it in this time span and you have to do it twice a year, there's not a lot of uh, leeway there. If you face one challenge, you're probably not going to make it. That's why um, that's why they migrate at night, because if they're to migrate during the day, then the Falcons and the Cooper's Hawks, they're going to take them out because they're so vulnerable. They're so small and uh, they're, they're not super strong at this point. Um, yeah, look at that. Absolutely. So this is taken from a boat in the Baltic Sea off Germany during migration over there because the ship itself was lit by bright lights and all those night migrating birds came down and landed right on the ship. Lighthouses have this problem. Um, the bottom line is if we want to have the least impact on birds, we need to turn, we need to create a dark sky everywhere where they're migrating. What are the periods of migration where this is worse? Uh, in the United States, it probably begins in the southern part as early as March and it goes all the way through May and even into early June when you're in, talking about in the north. So in springtime, there's like a three month window and in the fall, there's another three month window. Um, and then you also because in the fall, you have all these baby birds that are coming from the north 
south, right? So the number of birds in the air is a lot bigger than what it was in the springtime, just because during the winter, a lot of the birds die off. That's just normal population dynamics, but yeah. Um, and uh, one more point about having a dark sky. I mean, birds benefit humans in so many ways. Like we understand this. Everybody who has a bird feeder understands how awesome it is to have these migrant birds. Um, but another benefit to having a dark sky is we get to sort of commune with the greatest work of art that has ever existed. One of our oldest friends as, a, as the human species, which is the beautiful night sky. Uh, and we've lost that really. If you live anywhere near an urban center, you know, when you look up even on a clear night, you're not seeing the beautiful tapestry of constellations in the Milky Way that our ancestors did. So I think having a night sky um, is something that we should do really for our own sake and then also for the bird's sakes. Everything has value that's yeah. natural. And um, there's just so many reasons to diminish the impact that we have on our on our night sky. You know, the reason we want to save birds, the reason we want to conserve species and not allow them to go extinct extinct is not really about those species, is it? It's about having a world that people want to live in and where people thrive. It's really all about people and sense of place and having a healthy ecology and healthy water, healthy air, healthy habitats and populations because that's where humans do best. Thanks for watching and please like, subscribe and follow on all of our platforms at Real Birding. And we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Peace. Peace.